How about that? Yeah. Pretty good? Yeah. Pretty good. Welcome to Easter. Welcome to, uh, to our worship experience today. My name is Pastor Pat, and it is a privilege to, uh, to welcome you all into this space where we can come together as a family and worship Christ, the risen Lord. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we begin. The first one I want to point out to you uh, is coming up on Friday night. We are going to be having our worship under the stars on Friday, this coming Friday, uh, right over here in uh, in our playground area. So if you come at 6 o'clock on Friday for an hour of uh, good contemporary music, worshiping outside, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the, uh, the folks from Scoops and Scholars are going to have their mobile uh, ice cream thing here, so you can come up on Friday and get a little ice cream and listen to some good music and, and worship God. Huh? And we'll have a bounce house apparently out there too, so uh, <laughs> make sure you come on Friday and do that. The second thing I want to bring up just uh, really quickly because it is a change is that I've asked, I've had some people ask me uh, about the, the class that we're supposed to start tomorrow night, uh, and it is a, a survey class of what different denominations and different groups of Christians believe uh, around the world. Um, some folks are tired from Thursday night, Friday night, and now Sunday twice, um, and they're wondering if we can't put that off a week. I think we will. So for those of you who were planning to come tomorrow night to our <coughs> Sunday or our, uh, small group class, please put it on your calendar for next Monday and uh, enjoy tomorrow night on rest. Is that fair? That's fair. Um, that's all the announcements I have for you. So I want to begin our Easter worship Sunday with this passage. Hear this word from the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must raise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white <coughs> sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had, st had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, the king's teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Will you please stand? Let's join together in our call to worship. Sisters and brothers in Christ, on this holiest of mornings, let us gather with the whole community of God's people in heaven and on earth to share the good news of Christ's victory over death. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Let's sing, Christ the Lord is risen today.
disciples to come up. Just a moment. What's up, guys? Happy Easter. Happy Easter. All right. It's Easter. Hey, it's Easter. So Resurrection Sunday is what we in church like to call it. It's Easter is a, I don't know, it's a word that we inherited from the pagans. Y'all did, did you know that? <laughs> Easter with the E-R reversed at the end was actually a fertility goddess that was worshipped. I know, right? Makes you, makes you uh, think twice about using that word. It's Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. Now, what happens? What happened this weekend? Some of you were here for for, for worship. <laughs> so we had Good Friday. What happened on Good Friday? Right, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then what happened yesterday? Okay, so he's putting him on Friday, right after he died. Yesterday, a whole lot of nothing happened. A whole lot of nothing. So what happened yesterday? Yesterday is is a day of contemplation, which basically means. Uh, for the disciples, they watched Jesus be killed and put in the tomb. So they collected themselves on Saturday and had to figure out, well, what are we going to do now? The guy that we've been following, walking around with for three years, <coughs> sleeping out and camping and, and uh, eating food, whatever somebody would give us, this guy that we've been following for three years and we thought was the king is dead. Now what do we do? So that was Saturday. There's a whole lot of wondering what happens next. And then they wake up this morning, right? They wake up on, on Sunday, and the, the ladies go to the tomb, because they're going to anoint the body and do burial stuff like they normally do. That's what the <coughs> was there for, right? And what happens? The, roll, the stone is rolled away. It's empty. It's empty. So they're wondering what the heck's going on. Why would somebody take Jesus' body? He wasn't taken, right? But they didn't know that. They didn't know that. So we have this, uh, this experience, this first experience of resurrection, of someone who uh, was dead and now is alive, and what does that mean for us? That's the question now that we have to ask ourselves. Now, I want to uh, put in, uh, insert into this a little bit. You see about behind me? These are Easter lilies. These are Easter lilies. Thank you. Very, very correct. Easter lilies. I found out just a couple days ago. Then Easter lilies are grown from a little bulb that you plant in the ground. Did you know that? And I see it's a bulb. It's kind of a really big seed. And apparently, it has to be in the ground for a few years before it'll actually germinate and show signs of life. <coughs> it is the perfect plant for us as we remember the resurrection, right? Because you think about it, you're planting this bulb in the ground, and it doesn't show any signs of life. And years go by, and then all of a sudden, it comes out of the ground. And what is it showing? This is, we call this a trumpet, a lily trumpet. Yeah? It's the perfect, it's the perfect plant for us to remember that now that we have a new life, now that life has come from the darkness of the ground, that we should be trumpeting it, we should be shouting it. From the rooftops, that Christ is alive. He is not dead anymore. Not dead anymore. So, this is a lesson. Every time you see one of these Easter lilies, I want you to think about what that trumpet is telling us, what that, uh, what that story about the, 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 the pod is telling us. You can always tell me something. What? I have like a million flowers out in my patch at my house. <laughs> I love, that's a lot of flowers. Yeah, someday at the right time of year, I want your parents to invite you to come out for lunch and so I can see all those flowers. Is that fair? I'm not just going to show up, don't worry. But <laughs> that's a lot of flowers. Oh, I love lima beans. Make sure that after they grow, then I get some of those lima beans. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, I love that. Sunflowers. I like sunflowers. You know why I like sunflowers? It's because they, 
they when they come and they grow, they actually follow the sun during the day. You'll you'll see the, the whole thing. And they they uh, during the course of the day, as the sun moves over, the flowers will actually turn their face to the sun. Did you know that? That's why they're called sunflowers, right? And then they kind of look like the sun bursts. And they're a great uh, lesson for us too, because we we can always remember that as the, just like the sunflower follows the sun, that we can be following the Son of God. How about that for a lesson? I wasn't expecting to get that one, but there you go. <laughs> how about that? So see how that works? Bingo, bango. So let's uh, let's say a prayer, and I'll let you go back to your seats for the rest. Okay? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the lessons that you have given us in our lives as we look at your creation, whether it be the sunflowers or the lilies. Uh, you give us clues and suggestions and, and ways that we can remember the gift that you've given, the gift of new life in your son, Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the reminder that every time it feels like darkness is winning, that there is a resurrection around the corner that we can embrace, that we can hold on to, and we know that it is an embodiment of your love in our lives. And we thank you for those chances that you have given us. So as we get ready to leave later on, uh, as we go out into your world, help us to be that reflection. Help us to be the Easter lily, maybe, uh, uh, trumpeting the good news that Christ is alive and still is alive to this day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. I appreciate it very much. We are going to be singing the one of the great songs from the Easter portion of Handel's Messiah, uh, the holiday course. Enjoy.
comes from the book of Acts. We're going to be reading from chapter 10, just a short little passage here about, about Peter. Hear these words, it says this. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Almighty God, on this the holiest of days, we come as your, as your children to give you thanks and praise. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, but Lord, today, more than, more than anything else, we thank you for the new life that is offered in resurrection. We thank you for the lesson that, that Jesus has taught us, that we can simply trust in you, trust in your provision, trust in your plan, and that all things will be used for the good of those who love you. And so, Lord, today, we as a family, we lift our voices and our hearts to say, Alleluia. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And you will reign forever and ever. So, Lord God, reign over us. Guide us as we live our lives. Help us to see the, the world through your light. And help us to know what your plan is for us today and every day. Because above all things, we pray that your will is done. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Lord God, I pray all this in the powerful and holy name of Jesus, our Christ. And I ask now that you'll hear us as we lift up with one voice the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
A few years ago, right before Easter, a movie came out called The Case for Christ. Anybody see that? Maybe you read the book. It tells the true story of an investigative journalist named Lee Strobel. Uh, Lee's wife converted to Christianity from atheism. And so in response to what he considered to be his wife's newly found psychosis, Strobel decides to begin an investigation into the Christian faith. He tries to uncover evidence and clues and then lay them out in a narrative, in a story, in order to convince his wife to stop all this Jesus nonsense. Helps me turn my mic back. He starts his inquiry by asking a friend of his, who's a Christian, how he ought to begin this process. And his friend echoes the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15. And he says this, the linchpin for Christianity is the resurrection. If that didn't happen, the rest of it is a house of cards that will quickly crumble. The story through the rest of the movie, and again the book, is his journey how he interviews experts in fields like history and medicine and psychology and textual criticism, and he keeps getting answers that he doesn't want to hear. The evidence for the truth of the resurrection and therefore for the Christian faith builds and builds, but he stubbornly can't bring himself to admit it. Finally, though, after months of trying, he gives up. He goes home and he confesses to his wife what he's been working on for months. He gets on his knees with her. And he confesses to God that he's ready. He's ready to believe. He's ready to accept the evidence. He's ready to follow the risen Christ. Now, unfortunately, the, the movie ends there. After telling this wonderful story, the movie comes to, for me, an unsatisfying end. We do get a couple of information slides at the very end, right before the credits, that talks about how many books Strobel sold and how he joined the church where his wife was connected with God and, and eventually he becomes the teaching pastor uh, in that church. But we don't really get to see what the story of his new life and how his transformation really plays out. Lucky for us, though, Unlike the screenwriters in the movie, the writers of the New Testament didn't leave us with quite so unsatisfying an ending. They took it upon themselves to record the stories of their lives after they had encountered the resurrected Christ. In the Gospel, we heard this morning, the Apostle uh, John recounts for us the story of Mary Magdalene and her discovering the empty tomb and how she ran back to the others and then after they had come and gone, how at the entrance to the tomb, she encounters the risen Lord. Later in John's Gospel, we read about the time when, when Jesus visits the disciples in the upper room where they're hiding. And we, we hear how they thought he was a ghost, and so he ate and drank some stuff to prove that he was real. And then we get the story of Thomas, if you remember. He wasn't there the first time. So we get the story of how Jesus comes and, and, and visits again just so Thomas could see him. And then after the gospel, we get to the book of Acts, which is a wonderful sequel to the gospel of Luke. Um, you ought to pick it up every once in a while. Um, after the resurrection, we hear how Jesus teaches his followers and, and before he ascends to heaven. And the new life story of the disciples continues with the formation of the church at Pentecost and how they go about their work healing the sick and feeding the, the hungry and serving the poor. And, and heck, Peter even gets to raise somebody from the dead. How cool is that? That's a story we need to hear. If you think about it, so much that's happened over the last 2,000 years has happened because people like Mary Magdalene and Peter and the Gospel writers and, and Paul all decided that their stories were important to tell. That their encounters with the risen Christ were important to tell. And they decided that... The fact that Jesus died and was resurrected was too important not to share. And importantly for us, they didn't just stick to the facts about the resurrection. They, they told the stories of their lives. Fantastic, convincing, sometimes convicting stories. 
On this special Sunday, I can spend our time together going through all the evidence that Lee Strobel has collected. <clears throat> How historians acknowledge that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a real person. We can talk about the medical evidence for dying on a cross. We can recount all of the mentions, extra biblical mentions of Jesus and how he was seen alive after his crucifixion and how his followers thought him to be divine. We can go through all that and more, but really the only fact that truly matters is this. He lives. And because he lives, we live. And because we live, the stories of our lives with Christ continuously are being written. They're not finished. They're still being written today. So as we gather together in Christian community, aspiring to live the rest of our lives, to live out our stories with Christ more fully, there's a couple things we need to pay attention to. A couple things we need to focus on. The first thing I think is important is we should consider how the resurrection changed the lives of the disciples. Think about how the apostles went from complete fear for their lives on that Saturday that we talked about with the kids. They were desperate, afraid that the Romans were going to break down the door any minute. And they went from that complete fear on that Saturday to an all-encompassing joy and courage just one day later. The risen Christ changed everything for them, especially their perspectives. And they realized that they had nothing to fear, even death. And they burst forth from that upper room into the cities and into the countryside and proclaimed the good news. And the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost and they tapped into the power of God and they started performing their own miracles. If that's not cool, I don't know what is. They tapped into that spirit. Now sometimes, yes, they got arrested for preaching about the risen Christ. But that didn't change anything. And sometimes they started eventually getting killed for their preaching. But that didn't change anything either, because the rest of them kept on going. Their trust in Jesus was so strong that it just couldn't be stopped. It just couldn't be contained. They had seen and heard and touched the resurrected Jesus, and they could not be stopped from telling the stories of what they'd seen, of what they'd heard, and how it had changed them. The question is, can we? That's the question for us. In looking at the, the disciples, looking at the apostles, and, and them going out into the world, unafraid, can we be unafraid? Can we put aside fear? We can. The answer is yes, we can. But we have to have a good story. We have to have the story to tell. How? That's the second question. How then has your interaction, your belief, your faith in the risen Christ changed your life? How has the story of Christ intertwined with yours? That's the question you need to ask. Bishop, uh, Anglican Bishop and, and author N.T. Wright wrote this. He says, world history turned its corner when Jesus died on the cross and then rose again three days later. Every generation has to go on asking itself the question, how does that then play out in my world at my time? Now what I hear him saying is this, how does the story of Jesus intertwine with our stories, the stories of the world, in such a way that, can, that people can begin to grasp that the kingdom of God is at hand today, just like it was when Christ was preaching it in the day, first days of his ministry. How do our stories transform us, and how can they transform the world? Now, how do they transform us? For some, that answer might be difficult, for various reasons. I think maybe we grew up in the church, we never really thought about the difference that a relationship with Christ has made in our lives because we don't really know another way. Or maybe we've mistaken learning a lot about Jesus for learning how to know Jesus, how to be in relationship with Jesus. 
And if that's the case, yeah, the intertwining of our stories might be a little unclear and might take a little work. But for others of us, the answer to Jesus' place in our stories might seem easy. One of two ways. Either not at all, and no changes at all have been made, or everything has changed. Those are easy, easy answers to the question. Somebody might be here this morning who's only here because mom or grandma or somebody <coughs> asked them to come. <coughs> Fair enough? There might be somebody here who's not at all interested in being in a relationship with Jesus. They're just here to make mom happy. And kudos to you for at least coming to make mom happy. Okay? So, fair enough. But still, some of you might have felt the transformation happen in your lives. And you can clearly see the difference that Christ makes. You may have been living a life of bad decisions or purposelessness, uh, you, and then you, you had a visceral encounter with the risen Christ. Maybe you uh, struggled to overcome abusive relationships or addictions of some kind, or even the effects of other people's decisions. But somehow you came to know Jesus. And your whole outlook changed. Your whole worldview changed. Now, for those of you who know that your answer to that question was difficult, I, I would encourage you to wrestle a little bit with that answer. Go deeper. Don't be content with your spiritual journey so far. Talk with people whose stories may be different than yours. They might help you see what you've been missing. Look closely, more closely at your life. Try to identify those moments, how faith informed your decisions. And if you still can't see any difference, and I know this might sound radical, try spending some time with Jesus. Read your scriptures. Pray. Attend church more than twice a year. Spend some time with the risen Christ. <clears throat> As we celebrate today the resurrection of our Lord, we need to recognize and acknowledge the new life that Christ's resurrection offers to us. Let's each one of us look closely at our own lives and ask, how has the power of the risen Christ worked to defeat the power of sin and death in my life? Guess what? That power is available to you. The power to overcome is available to you if only you will receive it. How has the new life of Jesus given me new life? If it has, you know. If it hasn't, it can. Just like Lee Strobel's real story didn't end with that first transformational confession, the story of the resurrected Jesus doesn't end with the empty tomb here on Easter. And the stories of our lives with Christ don't end at when we make our confession of faith. Jesus' story of new life is still being written from within our lives. And these are the stories that we have to tell. <coughs> These are the stories that we have to be brave and tell to the world because the world needs to hear them. We pray with you. Father God, we, your church, call ourselves the body of Christ. And on this day, Resurrection Sunday, when we remember that the body of Christ rose again from the dead, we pray that this body of Christ can rise again. Bring us to a new kind of life, a new level of living that has with it the characteristic of the eternal. Not later when we die, right now. Help us to, to be a church alive. And then when we, when we shine in that new life out into this world, when people see the new life, the new resurrected life of our church, help them maybe, maybe, to choose to follow you, to be transformed, 
to see in color what may have just been a black and white life. The fullness of our life with you is open to us. And it starts when we say he is risen. And we mean it. So open us up to that good news today. And then embolden us in our faith so that we might shine for you. Amen. 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 <laughs> Folks, it takes some doing to go out into God's creation and share a word that we find to be hopeful and they find to be threatening. <coughs> and so we need our nourishment ahead of time. And that's what we find here at this table. Brothers and sisters, come to the table with me and remember the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us. When he took bread, gave thanks to God his Father, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which I am giving for you. And as often as you eat, eat in remembrance of me. And so, Lord Jesus, we remember. And as the supper was coming to a close, he took the cup and again gave thanks. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the cup of the new covenant, being poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink of it, drink in, uh, in remembrance of me. And so, Lord Jesus, we remember. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves, Father, in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here among these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. My communion helpers can come forward. Bless you.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go forth in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. Brothers and sisters, it is time uh, for us to come together and have our morning offering. Um, I pray that God will bless our offering, that he will multiply it, that he will guide us in our usage of it to make the biggest impact we can for his kingdom. If James and Jamie would prepare and come forward, let's go ahead and have our morning offering. <clears throat> One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth.
morning, Jesus Messiah. <laughs>
again. I know. He won't cry again. I'm sorry. That was all right. I feel great. I mean, I